Fatima and welcome back to another video in hematology practical series. Today we will be covering how to determine RBC count using hemocytometer. I will also point out some common mistakes during this procedure and share the tips to help you avoid them. Before we start, let's take a moment to reflect. Pause the video and think about this. What is the purpose of determining RBC count? Why is it important to know the value? Once you are ready, resume. As you might have guessed, RBC count is essential for diagnosing anemia. According to the data from 5th National Family Health Survey, anemia is widespread concern in our country, affecting people of all ages, with especially high rates in women and young children under 5. However, anemia isn't only the condition detectable through RBC count. Elevated RBC counts can indicate polycythemia as well. With this background in mind, let's dive into the practical portion. As we will be using hemocytometer to count RBCs, first let's see its principle. The process involves two main steps. First, RBCs are counted in known volume of diluted blood typically in 1 by 50 cubic millimeter and then we calculate RBC count per cubic millimeter of undiluted blood by multiplying with appropriate volume factor and dilution factor. To perform RBC count, you will need hemocytometer which includes the nubus chamber, a cover slip and an RBC pipette. You will also require RBC diluting fluid, a watch glass, lancet, cotton, spirit and of course microscope. When counting specific cell types, it's crucial to select appropriate diluting fluid. For RBCs, we commonly use Heme's fluid which contains 0.5 gram of sodium chloride for isotonicity, 2.5 gram of sodium sulphate to prevent rule of formation and it also contributes to isotonicity of the solution. 0.25 gram of mercury chloride is added as preservative to prevent microbial growth in the fluid. These are dissolved in distilled water to make up 100 ml of final solution. Now coming to the procedure. Before taking the finger prick, ensure that the chamber, cover slip and the pipette are clean and dry. Also check the patency of the pipette by blowing through it. If you feel an air current on the back of your hand, pipette is patent. Now focus RBC square under low power that is 10x objective and then remove it without disturbing any settings of the microscope. This saves your time when you are ready with the sample. For quick focusing, refer to my video on the topic and the link is in the description. Now take some RBC diluting fluid in a watch glass. This is an essential step before taking finger prick which can prevent your blood from clotting within the pipette. So once this background preparation is done, you are ready to collect the blood sample. Before we proceed, let me clarify that I will start by demonstrating all the ideal steps for this experiment. However, you may encounter practical challenges at nearly every step. Later in this video, I will cover all the common issues you might face and offer the solutions to overcome them. So make sure to watch the entire video without skipping. Ok, let's start with the collection of blood sample. Take a bold finger prick by following aseptic precautions. Wipe away the first drop and let the second drop form. Now place the tip of the pipette within the drop and gently draw the blood exactly up to 0.5 mark in the RBC pipette. Note that 0.5 mark is the line below the number. Avoid air bubbles as they affect the accuracy. Wipe the tip of the pipette to remove any excess blood sticking to it and then immerse it into the diluting fluid and draw it up up to 101 mark. Mix the contents thoroughly by holding the pipette horizontally between the palm and rotating it. This completes your preparation of the blood sample and you are ready to perform cell count. So let's see how to charge the chamber. Place a clean cover slip 
over the new bus chamber it should cover both the counting surfaces and the side gutters discard first two drops from the pipette and then allow the third drop to form touch this drop to the chamber's edge near the cover slip and capillary action will pull the fluid under the cover slip wait for a minute for cells to settle now place the chamber on the microscope stage without changing any settings since it is already focused under 10x you will just need a fine adjustment once it is done observe the distribution of the cells in the entire rbc square if the cells are evenly distributed switch to the high power objective and do the fine adjustment to clearly focus the squares move the stage to focus any one medium sized corner rbc square note that medium rbc squares are bounded by triple lines and have 16 small squares within them out of this triple lines middle line is the actual boundary of the medium square once you are in a corner square start counting the cells in this 16 small squares so first observe the top left small square note that it has triple lines on its top and the left side count all the cells within the square including the cells on the inner lines in this case there are 6 cells within the box for the cells on the lines follow inverted l rule so observe top and the left middle lines if the cells are present on these borders add them to your count and write the final number in the first box in your observation note here there is only one cell on the left border and none on the top so count for the first box is 7 cells on the outermost line like this one should not be counted some may consider the inverted l rule as right border and the bottom border it doesn't matter if you consider any two adjacent borders and stick to the same pattern during the entire process now observe the second square in the top row and repeat the procedure in this case there are four cells within the square and three on the upper and the left borders so again the count for this box is 7 note it down repeat this procedure for all the 16 squares then move to the next corner and repeat the process so in the same way you are going to count the cells in four corner rbc squares and one central rbc square thus you are counting the cells in 80 small rbc squares now coming to the calculation part note the cell counts for each medium square as n1 n2 n3 n4 and n5 If the difference between the maximum and the minimum count exceeds 20, recharge the chamber and repeat the counting process because it indicates that cell distribution is uneven. If the difference is less than 20, proceed with calculation. So do grand total of all the five squares total and denote it as n. Now you already know the dimensions of the squares. So dimension of one medium square is 1 by 5 length and 1 by 5 breadth and hence its area is 1 by 25 mm square the volume is 1 by 250 cubic mm if you want to know from where these numbers are derived refer to my earlier video on new bus chamber again the link you will find in the description below now since we have counted cells in such 5 medium squares the volume of 5 squares become 1 by 250 into 5 that is 1 by 50 cubic millimeter it means you have counted n number of cells in 1 by 50 cubic millimeter volume so to get the count in 1 cubic millimeter multiply cell count by 50 thus 50 is your volume factor alternatively you can derive the volume factor by considering the volume of 80 small rbc squares it will be the same okay so this is your rbc count in diluted sample to get the count in undiluted sample 
multiply the volume factor which is 200 because you have taken blood up to 0.5 and diluted till 101. So the final step of calculation is N into 50 which is the volume factor into 200 which is the dilution factor giving N into 10,000. So this is the RBC count in undiluted blood. Convert your count in terms of millions per cubic millimeter to express it in terms of normal units. Compare your results with the normal value to conclude if your count is within the normal range, whether it is low, suggestive of anemia, or it is higher, suggestive of polycythemia. So this completes your procedure. Before wrapping up, let's go over some important questions and the practical issues you might encounter and key precautions to follow. First, you may think, why should I wipe off first drop and waste my blood sample? First drop must be wiped off because it contains tissue fluid which could lead to inaccurate lower RBC count. So removing it ensures that your sample is pure and results are accurate. Next question you may get is, why should I use dry cotton to wipe the first drop? So always use dry sterile cotton to wipe off the first drop and avoid the cotton with the spirit as spirit prevents formation of proper blood drop. Instead, blood spreads across the finger making it difficult to collect. Additionally, spirit also causes hemolysis which would result in false low cell count. Some of you may think, why is it so important to collect the exact amount of blood sample without any air bubbles? A good question. Since we calculate RBC count using specific dilution factor of 200, we must draw blood exactly to the 0.5 mark and the diluting fluid 201 mark. Any deviation changes the dilution factor and affects the cell count. So now let's talk about those frustrating air bubbles. Air bubbles reduce the actual amount of blood in the pipette, giving a false low count. Let's see the various causes for formation of air bubbles. The very first thing is shallow prick. If the prick is too superficial, you will get inadequate drop, increasing the chances of bubbles. Second factor is wet finger. If your fingertip is wet, blood will spread and there won't be any formation of a proper drop. Another reason is removing the pipette from the drop. So keeping the pipette tip in the drop without lifting it is key to draw the blood without air bubbles. And the last factor which can cause air bubble formation is too much of suction force. A very strong or very rapid suction can easily pull air in. A moderate and steady suction helps to prevent this. So control your breathing and apply a gentle suction while pipetting to avoid air bubbles. Air bubble formation is the most common challenge for many of the students. For full guide on pipetting technique, check out my earlier video on this topic. Again, you will be finding link in the description. Okay, what if air bubbles enter the pipette? If any minute air bubble enters the pipette, don't panic. Just slowly blow the blood out of the pipette till the bubble is removed and then continue to draw the blood. If there are many air bubbles, then you need to wash and dry the pipette thoroughly and collect the fresh blood sample again by taking all the precautions. Sometimes it is also possible that accidentally you draw too much of the blood that is above the 0.5 mark. In that case, just gently tap the pipette tip against your palm to release the excess of the blood. Alternatively, you can gently blow out the excess of the blood sample on your fingertip until you reach to 0.5 mark. At this point, very important tip, never use cotton to remove extra blood from the pipette because cotton absorbs plasma and causes hemoconcentration leading to false high cell count. So remember, never use cotton to remove the excess blood. Now let's go through some important precautions while charging the chamber. Remember to discard first two drops from the pipette because it mostly contains diluting fluid. So discarding them ensures 
an accurate sample in the chamber. Next, avoid overcharging or undercharging. Overcharging happens if fluid flows into the gutters, while undercharging leaves air bubbles on the counting surface. And both these will affect your cell count. So aim for just right amount. Another important precaution over here, do not blow through the pipette for charging. Blowing through the pipette can lead to overcharging the chamber. So be gentle and allow fluid to move under the cover slip naturally. Lastly, let's cover some precautions while cell counting. First and the most important, before you begin to count, always examine your chamber under low power to ensure that cells are evenly distributed. This helps to maintain accuracy in your results and also saves your time later. Then follow inverted L rule for the cells on the borders. This prevents recounting and ensures each cell is counted just once. Recall the final step of calculation. It's n into 10,000. So if you count one extra cell, your count increases by 10,000. So be careful while counting. Here are some common viva questions that you might get during this practical. So be ready with your answers and best wishes. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Are you new to my channel? Then please subscribe it and press the bell icon to stay updated about the new releases. If you like the video, give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Thank you for joining in and see you in the next video.